Nick, why are you a better candidate for this House seat than the incumbent? That's a great question. Look, I mean, we talked about the values. I think we got to talk also about, uh, you know, who's really representing who here, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, you've got a candidate with Mary Peltola who's raised around a million dollars and growing. Certainly it'll be well over a million, maybe a million and a half from PACs, political action committees, in this election cycle alone. And to put that in perspective, there were entire races where our former member, Don Young, raised, didn't even raise that much. Let, from individuals, PACs, or any other groups. And so she is bringing enormous amounts of money from outside of Alaska to try to tell Alaskans who to vote for. In fact, more than 90% of the money that Mary Peltola has raised in this campaign has come from outside the state. Now, what's completely disingenuous is she sends out text messages and campaign communications suggesting that outside interests are going to tell Alaskans how to vote and they shouldn't listen. Well, she's right. Out, yeah. Outside interests are trying to tell Alaskans what to do, and they're telling them, vote for Mary Peltola. Why would they do that? Why does D.C. so desperately want Mary Peltola to come back? Well, it should be obvious because she's there to play ball with them. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and there I will tell you, there are 20,000, more than 20,000 registered lobbyists in D.C. Now, there's only 535 members of the Senate and the House combined. So you're greatly outnumbered when you're down in D.C. There are mm-hmm. there's a lobbyist around every corner. And why does it now I'm not saying all lobbyists are bad. They're there to give you some information, whatever. But these are the most persuasive people money can buy worldwide because the U.S. government is the largest single trough of cash worldwide. Mm-hmm. So these people exist for one of two reasons. Either they're there to protect the, their business or their industry from competition or they're there in order to get money from the government, from the taxpayer, okay? That's really the only two purposes for 90% of the lobbyists in DC. And they are fueling her campaign. That should tell you everything that you need to know about where Mary Peltola's loyalties and interests lie. And uh, what happens a lot of times in DC, and we see it over and over again, you see people who run for the right reasons. And they, maybe they're running on the left, maybe they're running on the right, but they really believe ideologically what, what they're running on at the beginning. And what occurs is they get there as a freshman and they realize, oh no, I, I, can't, I don't have the power that I need. I don't have the ability to do what I need. And so they start to compromise. They play ball, right, politically in these bodies. And they think, okay, it's worth it because in 10 years and 20 years, I'll be a chair. I'll be able to dictate policy and then we'll do what's right. Well, for those who finally make it, they've made so many compromises for so long, they don't even recognize themselves when they get there. And this is the problem with D.C., and it's the problem that we have with our current representative in office. She's following that path. She's allowing outside interests to control her messaging, control her campaign, and control her votes in the Congress. Yeah, I was really concerned about some of those early compromises. Like, she ran as a so-called moderate. I mean, we all knew that wasn't the case because— The Democrat Party worked so hard to strong arm Al Gross off the ballot, who was their endorsed candidate for Senate the previous cycle, so they could put her on. So I knew she must be just a much more extreme um, political candidate. And then she was propped up with outside money last time. I remember that when you ran against her in the last cycle. But then she staffed, you'll remember this, she staffed with a, a moderate staff in the beginning. A lot of Alaskans, a lot of people who were Republicans or moderate Republicans, and those people are nowhere to be seen now. It's a a graveyard of them. I mean, we've gone through, I don't even know how many staff members. It's a revolving door of staff members. She's in the top five rated of toxic work environments on the Hill. And, and they're replaced with all these extreme liberals that are all D.C. insiders. I'm sure you know more of the story. Tell us what you know. Well, you know, initially she, she had hired on a number of uh, Don Young's former staff, including Great. his chief and uh, had brought on staff that had previously worked for him. And so it really looked like to the public, oh, here's someone who's going to be working with both sides. It's going to that's going to take these people on and it's going to she's going to split the difference and go down the middle like she ran her campaign. But over the ensuing months, she turned all these people over. She replaced them, as you said, with with hard left progressives that certainly aren't from Alaska and don't represent the people of Alaska. She has one of the highest staff turnovers in the entire Congress. I think she's she's definitely in the top five. She may be in the top two. I think at one point she was in the top two for staff turnover. 
And uh, look, a, a state like Alaska is complicated. It's very complicated. Mm -hmm. When you think about California or Texas, they have 40, 50 members or more from their state in the Congress. They can split up what they call the portfolio, right? So you've got maybe one person takes health care, another person takes resources, another person takes another issue or another issue, and one, one person's on judiciary. So they have the ability to, to sort of divide and cover an entire portfolio. We don't have right. that luxury. We have a complicated state and we have to cover all of the portfolio on behalf of the state in the Congress. So if you've got continuous turnover in your office, there is no way you can do it. And uh, it's unfortunate she hasn't recognized that. And it's also obviously unfortunate that she's replaced the people who sort of knew the, knew where the bathrooms were, knew how, to, knew how to get around the Hill, understood the portfolio that Don Young had been working on and got rid of them all and replaced them with, you know, sort of the stamped progressive folks. And that's not good for Alaska. And I think it probably is why we've seen, you know, her voting record be what it is. I mean, she crosses the aisle occasionally for a political reason, but 90% of the time she's voting with Nancy Pelosi. Mm -hmm. 85% of the time, Ilhan Omar she's voting with. And I can tell you, if there's anything that I'm, I'm certain of when it comes to Alaskan uh, political ideology, it's that we would never hire Nancy Pelosi to be our representative. She is a San Francisco Democrat. We have nothing in common with her. She has no, no interest in seeing Alaska grow or develop. And yet here, Mary Peltola is voting in virtually lockstep with her. That's our voting record. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you just also referenced, Nick, that she's voting about 85 percent of the time with Ilhan Omar. And I found that really concerning. Um, something I was going to say was it's, it's almost like she's an extended member of the squad. And one of the issues with her campaign is it's it's funded by some of the same people who have been funding these anti-Semitic protests that we're seeing across the country. So you you look at some of the people who are funding her campaign and you look at her votes. Mm. 85% of the time with Ilhan Omar, who is an avowed anti-Semite. I mean, clearly, with the comments and the yeah. things that she has, she, she has said yeah. publicly. Um, and then she's also vote, she's also being funded by these uh, these anti-Semitic folks who are funding these anti-Semitic protests. Uh, what, are some of your thought, what are your thoughts on that? Because that, to me, is, is actually very concerning, because that is not Alaska. That's not Alaskan. It's not American either. I mean, yeah. you know, Israel has been our long-standing ally in the Middle East. They are the regional counterweight to terrorism throughout the Middle East, specifically in Iran, but of course throughout their region. And th the problem is if you don't support Israel, their right to exist, defend their ability to defend themselves from terrorism, what message are you sending the rest of our allies, right? If right. we're not going to stand with our allies when they need us, what makes us think that our allies will stand with us when we need them? Right. And, uh, you know, when you're taking money, gladly accepting cash from all corners, including people who are fueling this anti-Semitic push that we see on the hard left, it, it just demonstrates that you have no principles, right? I mean, she will take money from anyone who's willing to write a check. She, she won't denounce any of this. She hasn't denounced any That's of right. this. That's right. And uh, look, you know, words are one thing, but actions are another. And if she's not willing to, re to refund that money or to disavow those resources coming into her campaign, it's tacit acknowledgement that she's OK with it. And, uh, you know, we need we need to be clear about this as Americans, whether you find yourself, you know, on the, on the Democrat side or the Republican side, or if you're like most Americans, probably somewhere in the middle, you got to recognize it again, going back to the first segment we talked about about those values that do not change. This is one of those values that we can't compromise on. We've got to stand strong. In the aftermath of 9-11, Israel gave us tremendous intelligence about where things were coming from, what we needed to do in order to fight the war on terror, practices that we need to implement uh, in the wake of those attacks. And to abandon that ally and that strategic relationship at their most important moment of need, it's beyond the pale.